All right, we're dancing right into chapter four here, and we're going to need to talk about our numbers a bit. Specifically, we're going to need to look at our number line, and we're going to have to recognize that we have many different types of numbers. And the first type that we learn are usually our counting numbers, where we go from zero, one, two, and so on, all the way up to infinity, you know, hiding off there on the right of our graph. Um, and of course it has a negative side and all of a sudden I have integers right? and these are the integers all the way down to negative infinity and what is neat about the integers is nothing exists in between them with counting numbers or counting things the, the, the gaps between them are what we call discrete and these are going to be discrete numbers. Now, there are many different ways you can make discrete numbers, but the key is that there's a space between each number and it's not filled. On, if we compare it to another type of number, which is our real numbers, the numbers that we can measure with rulers, get my number line a little bit, which goes to 0 to 1 to 2 to 3 and down and all the way up to positive infinity and negative infinity. They're, they're built off of these ideas of the integers but in here I can have 0.5 I can have 0.75 I can have 2 thirds I can put other numbers. In fact, in between any two numbers in here, I can always wedge another number. In fact, in between any two numbers here, I can wedge an infinite amount of numbers. And so something is different between these two types of numbers that will matter for some of the things we're going to measure. So for chapter four, we're going to focus on discrete variables and things that are countable. And the difference between these is I can make a list out of these. These are listable. I can make a list, listable numbers, or discrete. And for these, I can't make a list for them. There's no pattern that holds them. Because somewhere in here, there's going to be pi. Somewhere else, there's e and I have these irrational numbers that pop up and I can always squeeze another irrational. I can do pi over 4, I can do pi divided by 3.2, I can do pi divided by 3. I, I get all these infinite amount of numbers that I can always wedge in to some place coming across. Where here I have these gaps and so for these types of numbers I can make a list. For all of the real numbers I can't. And so we're going to talk about them separately. And that's why we create this first section called discrete probabilities. Or probabilities that come from listable, countable things. Listable, countable things. And so to do this, we're going to talk about random variables. In most cases, I'm going to do a random variable as the letter x. And it represents a numerical value that is, oops, that is the outcome of a probability experiment. And so we have some outcome of a probability experiment, and that's going to be our random variable. Um, so we can have two types. I'm going to have the number of calls um, in one day by a sales rep. Number of calls in one day by a sales rep. That, that's a random variable. Right, now call, um, we can also have the time spent on calls in one day by a sales rep. So you can have 
the number of calls in one day by a sales rep, and we have the time spent on a call in one day by a sales rep. Now notice, this is countable and listable. This is a discrete random variable. Because the number of calls are countable. Now the time spent on calls in one day isn't. Right? Now, for one particular sales rep, I can count exactly, I can measure exactly what their time is. But for any of the sales rep, one could do 2.51, one could do 2.75, another could do E, okay? um, another could do 2.731468. There's no countability in the numbers that could fall into this variable. Well, for this one, and I'm going to have some integer, right? I'm not going to make a quarter of a call. So I can, can, my random variables could be 4 or 8 or 9. But I can make a list of the possibilities here. Here I can't. And so we have a discrete random variable and a continuous random variable. Now when we draw our random variables on the number line, we draw discrete variables as a point. They're a definite point. And when we draw our continuous random variables, which will be the ones that take the real number, they tend to take up a wedge. They take up some section. Right? They, they take up, a, 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 um, as we'll sometimes see, kind of like a whisker around a given point. And so the discrete ones are definite points on the number line, and what we're going to call the continuous ones, which we'll look at in the next chapter, form a smear across the number line, or, or, or a section of the number line. So, continuous random variables and discrete random variables, we're going to focus on discrete random variables, and we're going to let them make discrete probability distributions. Uh, since, uh, so discrete probability distributions. And so how we make these is we make a frequency distribution. for all possible outcomes. Remember how I said the frequency distribution would come back and we had this f over n in our, um, our descriptive statistics that I said will come back? Well, here we're going to look at it from a probabilistic range. And later on, we'll look at what we can infer from it. So if we sum the frequencies, okay, I'm going to abbreviate them sum of the frequencies, well that was n. Remember we had that from before, the sum of the frequencies is n, the number of things in our distribution. And then we find the probability, find the probability for each outcome. And then we have a check we have to make on it. Each outcome needs a probability. Well, it needs to be, I'll just do it right now, the probability needs to be between 0 and 1. Because that was our rule um, on probabilities, that, that the event had to make a probability. It makes no sense if a probability is greater than 1, and it makes no sense if a probability is less than 0. And so each one of these we make has to be between 0 and 1, and the sum of all of them has to equal one. My probability distribution has to cover every possible outcome. If I cover all possible outcomes, the sum of the probabilities are going to be one. And so what we do is we create a table that has the value and the frequency. So again, using the slides in there, we're, we're going to look at a psych psychological test that um, rates the passive to aggressive test traits of people and it gives it a score between 1 and 5 with 5 being 
aggressive and one being passive. And so the possible values or the outcome of the probability experiment is one, two, three, four, and five. And then the frequency is the number of responses each that were gathered for each value from the surveys given out. And so what we want to do is we want to add up the number of the probabilities. Now we know how many people took the survey. It was 150, but we want to double check. Four plus three is seven, nine, zero, carry my one, three, six, 10, 15. And so yes, we have 150 respondents. And so my probability is 24 out of 150, 33 out of 150, 42 out of 150, whoops, make that a 150, 30 out of 150, and 21 out of 150. And I'll add this up, 24 and 33, 42. Well, I know I'm gonna get 150 out of 150, so this probability does add back to one. But we're gonna want this in our decimal form. And so what, 24 divided by 150 is going to be 0.16, or 16% chance uh, of the first part. 0 0.22, 0 0.28, 0 0.20, and 0 0.14. And so we have the beginning of our probability distribution table here. We have probabilities for each value of x. And what we can do is we can go back and well, we can look at this. We can look at this graphically, like we did with probability distributions back in descriptive. Right? In fact, we are doing descriptive statistics. We're looking at um, data we gathered, and we're graphing it in a way where we're focusing on the frequency distribution. And so there's one, two, three, four, five. And I'll make 0 0.05, 0 0.10. Let's see what's the highest number, 28. So I'm putting my frequencies here, my frequency, um, my probability, right? My probability going up my y-axis here. And so here, 1 is 16, so it's going to come right about here. 2 goes up to 22, so it's going to be about here. 3 goes up to 28, so that's the one that almost makes it all the way up to 50. 4 goes to 20, so it's down here. And Five goes to 14. Now I want to talk about something now that's going to come up later. Each one of these bins or these class widths or these classes has a width of one because this is a discrete distribution where we step one to one to one. So if I find the area of this particular rectangle it's going to be one times its height which is 0.16. If I find the area of this rectangle, it's going to be 1 times its height, which is 0.22. And so if I find the area underneath the curve that this makes, underneath the outline of it, well, it's the sum of 1 times each probability, or 1. And so the area under the curve is 1 which in probability right, is equal to 100%. And so these things represent probabilities. And when we look at our graphs, they can also represent areas. Areas and probabilities will, will from a mathematical sense, borrow off of each other. And so uh, we'll want to think of the area under the curve as representing um, a 100%. 
So Ariander's the Ariander the curve is 100%. And if I think about the percentage of any groupings, like of one and two, well, the area under these two things is my 0.16 and 0.22, or 0.338. And so the area representing particular outcomes represents the odds. And so area and probability are, are, are going to be tied together nicely for us. Now, one of the things we want to find is we want to find the mean. And so the mean is a weighted mean. In our case, what we can do is we can I'll call this the probability of x now. We'll give it the term probability. Is the weighted mean is going to be our value times the probability. And the probability acts like a weight from the weighted averages that we did before, or the weighted mean. But because this adds up to 1, I don't have to divide by the total of the weights, because anything divided by 1 is itself. And so we can find the mean by adding up x times the probability. So 1 times, so I'll over here do the x times the probability, and 1 gives me 0 0.16. Um, 2 times this is 0 0.44. 3 times this is, let's see, that's a 4 carry my 2, 0 0.84. Um, and let's see, 0 0.2 times 4 is 0 0.80. And 5 times this is 0 0.70. So if I add these up, I get 10, 4, carry my 1, 6, 14. 14, 22, 2.94. And so my mean for this probability distribution is 2.94. Because I do a weighted average where the weight's going to be 1 and the probability is what I'm weighting by. And so I take my value times the probability and I add up my result and I get a mean of 2.94. Now, the standard dis, um, standard deviation, which I'll put down here, standard deviation is the square root of the sum of x minus mu squared times my probability. And so I have to make a column of x minus mu, and then I have to square each value in the column. And so we want to keep track of what x minus mu is. And so remember, it's our x value minus mu. So 1 minus 2.94, which is negative 1.94. 1 minus, or 2 minus 2.94 is negative 0.94. And this is 0 0.06. 1.06 and 2.06. Now I'm going to square each of these values. So negative 1.94 squared. Remember squaring a negative gives me a positive value. So negative 1.94 squared is 3.7. Let's see if I have enough room here. 3. Point, oops, 3.7. 3.7636. 3 let me erase this a bit here. So I'm just gonna I'm gonna make another column, x minus mu squared, and I get 3.7636. 3.7636. Now am I fitting that all on the board? Just barely. Yes. So 3.7636.94 squared. 0.94 squared. Now I'm doing my calculator off on the side. I'm just putting the answers back up here. Is 8836. 0.8836. 0.06 squared. Is 0036 and 1.06 squared 
I really like having calculators. They make some of these maths easier. Is 1.1236 and 2.06 squared is 4.2436. And so I'm going to add all of these up. And when I add all of these up, I get 1.6164. And so now I've summed all of these. Well, I have to multiply by the probability, don't I? And so I don't get 1.6164 here. I gotta multiply by the probability. I need to create more room. It's a problem with running out of room sometimes, and a problem with doing these columns. So let's bring all of this information down here. So I have 3.7636. Um, then in I have 0.8836. That everything went all over the place here. Zero zero three six. One point one two three six. One point one two three six. Every time I move my pen, it jumps. There we go. One point one two. Oops. One point one. One two three six. I think that's right. One one. 1.11236 and 4.2436. 4.2436. All right. And so we have all of our um, x minus mu squared, right? So this is x minus mu squared. If I didn't run out of room here, right, we would continue. We would do, we need to do, if we look at our formula here. We need to do x minus mu squared times the probability of x. And so if I had room on the screen, I would have had these, and I would have had x minus mu squared times p of x. That would have been my next. So I'm going to write my p of x is here. So I'll rewrite p of x here, which is 0 0.16, 0.24, Zero point two eight, zero point two zero, and zero point one four. Looking at this, remembering them from here, and so now I need to multiply this times this to create. So I need my x minus mu squared times p of x, because I'm doing this formula here, and so I need x minus mu squared p of x, so I can sum it up. Let's go back to the calculator, and so 3.7636 times 0 0.16 is equal to 0 0.60216. Got it? No, oh, 2176. 2176. And then in 0.8836 times 0.24 equals 0 0.212064. 0 0.0036 times 0.28 is equal to point zero oops that's right point zero zero one zero zero eight and point two times one point one two three six equals point two two four seven two and then 
the last one. 4.2436 times 0.14 is equal to 0.59. Four one zero four. Now this I add up. So I type all of these back into the calculator, and now I'm going to get let's see, one point six one six four. And so I have my standard deviation is going to be the square root of one point six one six four, or one point two seven. 1.3. And so with these probability distributions, we can find the mean and we can find the standard deviation. We can talk about how the chance of something having a particular x value um, will line up or come out in the distribution. All right, on the next slide, I'm going to do all of this all over again, but on the calculator so that we don't have to build these charts. We don't have to build our way out. We're going to let the calculator keep track of our data, our x value, and our frequency for us. And in doing such, we get this information much more quickly.